So what I try to do is list on the front part uh, some of the key topics and some of the terms that we're going to cover during the talk. And on the back side, we always talk about Germans. And I thought this time, you know, to use an example as a family research project and kind of pull everything together, we'd use an Irish uh, family instance this time. So there are some of the, the links and so forth to follow along. And I have to say, uh, at NGS in St. Charles in May, a couple of us went there, uh, there was a great speaker from Ireland, John Brenham, that was there. And I went to a, a bunch of his talks, and it was very good. We're going to try to get him for a future program, although it's very expensive to try to get somebody from Ireland, maybe for a spring seminar or a full day event. But also recently, in June, I was out at the, uh, the International German Convention in Sacramento, and I managed to pick up his book. It's a $46 value. And when you buy an Irish book at a German conference, it's $15. So I think I got a good deal. I had to get it home in my suitcase. Here's kind of the structure of the way I, I kind of put the talk together, and hopefully this uh, makes sense. So what I figured we'd talk about first is, is the basics. You know, as we were all excited last year. Uh, when the announcement came out that after some of us for decades waiting, uh, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati released their records to Find My Past. And we're not going to talk about Find My Past and how to navigate that tonight. And because Julie's going to have a talk in November that goes into a little bit more detail. Uh, I can tell you there's a lot of in, uh, questions. So we know they haven't got everything online yet. Um, if you're a Find My Past user or member, you may want to keep track, checking back, but just be assured that everything there isn't online yet. So I thought we'd start with, with the fundamentals and talk a little bit about the record history. It'd be nice to think that the reason the records were created for us to find our, our ancestors, but that really wasn't the reason. Talk just briefly about canon law. So and again, if you've ever heard any of Judy Russell's talks, you know that that's a big theme of hers, is to really understand the records and what you're going to find in the records you got to understand the law that created them. And so we'll talk a little bit about the canon laws. Before Vatican II, of course, everything that you're going to see is in Latin. So there's some tricks to navigate through that, and we're going to spend some time on that. And then a little bit about given names, some family names, and some unusual names that you're liable to see in, in going through the actual records. So that's the basics, it seems kind of like Jeopardy here, right? The categories are. And we're going to spend some time on Hamilton County specific items, ethnic parishes. And for us today, that's something that's kind of strange to us, but in the 19th century, that was very prevalent. Particularly, it started the Germans. When they came here, they wanted schools in German for their children to learn German. And so, even though when you look at the census and your ancestor lived on a particular street or street corner, you look at the city map and there's a parish one block away. If it was an Irish parish, they may walk five, six, eight blocks to get to a German-speaking parish where their kids went to school because they wanted to learn the German language. If you talked to her, went to Father David Andrus's talk on the history of the Archdiocese last fall, he spent a lot of time on ethnic parishes, what was the cause of them, and then really in the 1920s and 30s, Archbishop Moeller and then McNicholas consciously tried to reverse that. So what they did is, in the traditionally German parishes, they appointed an Irish pastor, and in the Irish parishes, they appointed a German pastor uh, to kind of force that issue. And I think really the driving force more was the end of World War I and the German hysteric hysteria, and they couldn't, uh, teaching German in public schools was outlawed. So. Uh, the whole reason for having a German parish with the German school kind of went away. So it, it was a little bit easier. And then we're going to talk about, you know, how to find the records and where to look uh, and what's available. And then we're going to spend a lot of time just looking at the records. So baptisms and births, uh, marriages, burials and dates and deaths. And, and really that's what we like, right, because it fits nicely into our pedigree charts. Uh, I'm not going to talk about confirmation or First Communion records. In general, they usually exist, but they're really pretty not useful. Um, typically, it's a date and a column on the left side with the boys and the column on the right side with the girls of who was confirmed, and that's about it. 
So really where it comes into use is if you've got a lot of movement and you can try to locate that a family existed or lived in a given parish with a confirmation record, then you know they were still there. But other than that, they tend not to be very useful. And then we're going to spend time on an example uh, of just kind of pulling everything together for an Irish family. Okay? So let's get started on the basics. Uh, and again, you know, the, real, the original primary purpose of the records was to check for consanguinity, so in other words, uh, intermarriage. And you remember, those of us that are a little older, in, in the bulletins in the 60s and so forth, you would have uh, the bands published every week or read in, in the church. Um, and in Europe, it was the same way. It was typically they would announce it. It wasn't anything written. But it was to uh, announce that a couple was getting married, and if anybody in the parish, who most likely knew everybody, uh, knew of any reason why they shouldn't, if they were already married in another village, or they were um, first cousins or whatever, they would have a chance to speak up and let people know. Um, some of the registers in Italy uh, go back to the 1300s, but that's not very uh, normal. Really, the first time we start to see parish records being kept is in 1538, when King Henry VIII uh, passed a law in England that required the registers to be kept, and it basically he was trying to check to make sure that everybody in his kingdom was going to the Church of England. So it was, again, to separate the Protestants from the Catholics and make sure that uh, to force the issue. In practicality, most of those records were destroyed during the English Civil War, so again, you probably, uh, the earliest you're going to find is the early to mid-1600s. Um, and the same thing in Germany, again, Martin Luther in 1517, uh, with his 95 Thesis, started the Lutheran religion, and again, the reason the records started being kept, it was to keep track of who was Lutheran, who was Reformed, who was Catholic, and again, when the Thirty Years' War came in 1618 to 1648, it was basically village against village, prince against prince, Catholic against Protestant, and really, a third of the population of Germany was destroyed and killed during that time. And most of the records were burnt as one village kind of attacked another one. So again, practically in Germany, 1650 is about the earliest you're going to find uh, records from that, that point. But again, the reason that the records started and being kept was to keep track of who was who. So talk a little bit about the canon law and what you're going to find in the records. So for baptisms, in Canon 867, parents are obliged to take care that infants are baptized in the first few weeks as soon as possible after birth. So again, that's very different than the Methodist, uh, the Baptist tradition where it's, you have to be as a teenager or as an adult and make the confirmation that you want to be a member yourself. The law, the Canon law requires that parents as soon as possible, and you'll find in the 19th century, usually the day or the day after the birth, they're going to the church to get baptized. The pastor of the place where the baptism is celebrated must carefully and without delay record in the baptismal register the names of the baptized with mention of the minister, the parents, the sponsors, the place and date, the conferral of baptism, and the date and the place of birth. So again, that's all the stuff that we want, right? If it concerns a child born to an unmarried mother, the name of the mother must be inserted if her maternity is established publicly or she seeks it willingly in writing or before two witnesses. Moreover, the name of the father must be inscribed in a public document of his own declaration before the pastor, and two witnesses proves his paternity. In other cases, the name of the baptized is inscribed with no mention of the father or the parent. So the, the child is baptized, but it's always recorded, um, but you may just see the mother's name if the father isn't recognized or he doesn't want his name in there. Sometimes she puts it in there to force the issue if she's going to a civil court to try to get some money back or something like that. But if you see it not in the father or the mother not in there, a lot of times the child is left, you know, in a basket in front of the church. Uh, so they take the child in, they baptize it, but they don't know who the mother or the father is. But the child is always baptized and that's recorded. Um, if it concerns an adopted child, the names of those adopting are to be inscribed, and at least if it's done in the civil records of the region, also the names of the natural parents. Now, in the 19th century, that wasn't always followed. Uh, and again, a lot of the adoptions weren't through the civil courts. Uh, they were kind of informal. And so you may not, 
see any of the natural parents, it's just who was adopted. Uh, 1078, a dispensation is never given from the impediment of consanguinity in the direct line or in the second degree of the collateral line. So the direct line would be father, daughter, mother, son, grandmother, grandson, uh, grandfather, granddaughter, or brother and sister. So that was never allowed. And then the second degree of the collateral line, that would be anything closer than a second cousin. Um, so again, the, if you see a goody married in the justice of the peace, and they're closer than that, that's why. Uh, after the marriage has been celebrated, uh, the pastor of the place of the celebration uh, is to note as soon as possible in the marriage register the names of the spouses, the person who assisted, and the witnesses in the place and date of the celebration of the marriage. And that would be in the church where it occurred, even if it's a visiting priest or they went um, somewhere else. Illegitimate children are legitimized by the subsequent valid, valid marriage of the parents. So sometimes you see an illegitimate uh, baptism recorded, and then if the parents are subsequently married, you'll see a notation maybe with the father, and then says you know they were now legitimate. Uh, when the burial has been completed, a record is to be made in the register of the deaths according to the norm of the particular law. So again, burial records of the name, the age, usually um, where they were buried to. Okay. Again, when we're dealing with Latin, sometimes you can figure out the names, but here's some, some peculiar ones. So if you see the name Aedius, that's uh, usually in Gaelic, it would be Gael, so if you're dealing with Irish families. <laughs> Arminius would be Herman uh, in English. Carolus or Carl uh, would be Charles in English or Carl in German. Uh, one that's kind of hard to figure out, Dionysius would be Dennis. Eugene. Uh, again, you can translate it as Eugen for German, but the Gaelic form of it, if you're dealing with the Irish, it would probably be Owen, and sometimes Gene, or sometimes Kevin. So again, some of these are kind of tricky when you see them in Latin, it's not obvious. Uh, Ulielmus is William, or William. Again, you'll see that quite a bit, but it's not, I don't think, obvious. Walter would be Walter. <laughs> Another strange one is Hieronymus, would be Jerome. Jacob would be, it's a, that's a difficult one to translate because Jacob is a name in English, but if you're dealing with the Irish, it's probably James in English. Uh, in German, it would be Jacob. The same thing with Johannes. Or in English, it would be John. It could be Jack, or it could be the Gaelic form Ian. So again, that could be, it's kind of hard to translate from the Latin one to one to say, what is it going to be? In German, it could be Johann or Johannes. And, you know, Nickname could be Hans. Uh, Ludovicus would be Louis or Ludwig. And then the, the women's names, Grazia would be Grace. Wilhelma would be Wilma or Wilhelmina, uh, depending on their Irish or, or German. Honora, you're going to see this time and time again. It's a very popular Irish name. And usually it gets translated as Nora, uh, but sometimes it's Noreen and sometimes it's Anna. Again, it's not a one to one. Uh, another one that's really hard is Joanna. And again, for the Irish, it probably is Jane, but it's not a given. It could be Joan, it could be Joanne. Uh, if you're dealing with the Germans, it's probably Johanna. And then Ludovica would be Louise or Louisa. And then Maria, you would be Mary or Marie. And then in German, Maria. So you're going to see, these are all going to be written in Latin. And sometimes, like I said, it's very easy and logical And some of these I don't think are very logical or very easy to, to figure out. When you're dealing with last names, a lot of times people say, well, I looked at the index and I know they had five kids and I found three of them, why can't I find the other two? Well, you know, when you're going down the list and you see the name, if you find them, that's great. Um, if you don't, start thinking about other variations. So if you're used to using the sound index, um, if you've been doing genealogy for a while, you know you had to go take your name and you had to go code it with those letters that sounded alike. So if you've got a name and you can't find things, start looking for those common letters. So in, in German, an F and a B sound exactly alike, phonetically. So you're going to see a lot of variations. A C and a K, interchangeable. A G and a C, they can sound awful lot alike. The same thing with D, T, and M and N. So if you know, the, the letters at the beginning of the name 
And obviously, if they phonetically uh, wrote it differently, it's going to be in a very different place in the index to search for. And you can see here, at least in some of the Irish names, McLaughlin, you can see O'Laughlin, McLaughlin, Hugh, McHugh, McDonald, O'Donnell, McDonald, McDonald, you know, Pierce and Pierce, Kilfoyle and Gilfoyle. You kind of see, you know, when you're just asking people their name and you're writing it down, you think nobody's ever going to look at this register again, you're not going to be too picky. So start to if you find the names, that's great. If you don't, start thinking along these lines and then go search again. Or, you know, if you're just doing it the brute force method and going through the register page by page, you're probably going to see a lot of this variation. Here's some strange names that, uh, at least strange to us probably today, that you're probably going to see. Maybe some of the siblings and so forth. The pink ones are, are somewhat common female names, at least back in the 19th century. The male names are on the right in the blue. And again, you're probably going to see uh, if you're doing German research, a lot of those. And some of them may be, uh, they're named after the patron saint of the parish. If your ancestors are more Southern European, and like the Italian Spanish tradition, a lot of times they name them after the feast day of the saint when they're born. So a name like uh, Baltazar, you would automatically think January 6th, the feast of the three kings. So a lot of times, you know, depending on which tradition you come from, and you see a strange name like that, go get an old book of the Feast of the Saints before Vatican II and look at that date, and you probably see that they were named after the, the feast day of the, that particular saint. So it's, again, you know, as you're trying to write your family history and see these strange names, that may be the reason why they're, they're coming. The parents were just naming them after the godparents or sometimes after the feast days of the saints that they were born. So, Hamilton County. So, some of us that have been doing genealogy for a while, so when we were forced to write requests to the archives, uh, you send a letter in and says, I'm looking for my ancestor, Johann Schmidt, who was born about 1862 in Cincinnati. Please send me his baptism. Right. <laughs> and you, know, you try it, you send in your $25, you get nothing. You try again, you get nothing. Third time, maybe you get it. And then you think, well, why did I spend all this money? Same thing as if you volunteer at the archives and you get a request saying, I'm looking for my ancestor, John Ryan, who was born about 1871 in Cincinnati. I like to, his baptism certificate. It's like, okay. Here's part of the problem. So here's a map of Cincinnati in, in 1870. Um, and I put uh, a little pin or an uh, icon of where all the Catholic churches were in 1870. So where do you start to look? Uh, you can see some of these are literally a block apart from each other. And most of these had four to 500 baptisms a year during this time period. So you know, without an index, without anything, trying to go through these page by page by page, you certainly run out of steam pretty quickly. So one strategy is, uh, what I did is highlighted, the ones in red, or the red pins there, are the German parishes and the green ones are the Irish parishes. So if you know your ancestor is Irish, you're probably going to start with an Irish parish first and look and see, okay, if I thought, you know, the blue line is the Miami Erie Canal, so this would be Central Parkway right here, and then Eagleson <coughs> Avenue, the courthouse right there. So, you know, if my ancestor lived here, let's say right here, and he was Irish, uh, Holy Trinity is right here, but I'm probably not going to go there. I'm either going to go down to St. Patrick on 3rd Street or I'm going to go up to the Cathedral or St. Anne there. So, again, it, it helps to, to use the ethnic parishes to be your friend and locate um, where they are at. The other thing is, since this is an 1870 map, and 1870 didn't list the streets, but um, the census listed the wards, you've got the ward numbers right here in this map. So you can kind of pinpoint at least the position of where they lived at the time. Uh, the other nice thing that put together is the chronological order of when each parish was founded, uh, the name of it, their address, or the, look, the neighborhood, and then when did the, rec the baptism record start, when did the marriages start, when did the burials start, and then in the 19th century, whether they were traditionally a German or an Irish parish. 
and you don't have to copy this down. This is going to be in the new and improved guide that's coming up in a, a couple months, and this table will go up to 1920. So you can refer back to this, you know, in your research. It'll be part of the, uh, the new guide. So we're trying to help out because I think this is useful. And particularly, if you're 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 looking for an ancestor in a given given year, and you're trying to look at the particular parish, but the parish records don't start the year after. You're not going to find it. Uh, the other thing to notice is I highlighted in yellow here. The Irish parishes typically didn't keep a birth a burial register, so that may be an issue. Um, but we're going to talk about those after the break of the strategy, how to get around that. So if you're if you're asking, you know, the archdiocese right now or when finally the task comes out, uh, I'm looking for a burial of my Patrick Ryan that died in 1869, and now they belong to St. X. Well, they didn't keep it. So you're not going to find it. Okay. Another thing is is when you have so this is an example from St. Michael, which is in the West End, and it was it was kind of far out at that time. Um, but you see, there's a couple Irish families that lived out there, and they didn't want to walk all the way into town, so they baptized their their kids there. Um, but at the time, it was a German pastor, and you see a little bit he struggled with the name, so. I translated it here, it's the John, the son of John, phonetically, Bora C, is how he wrote it with his German ear, but he was nice enough to put in parentheses HIV, which is Latin for Hibernia, which means Irish. So if you phonetically sound that out, Bora C, it would be Bora C. The next entry here is Catherine, the daughter of Robert Wallace, again, Phonetically sounded out, isn't that Wallace? But Wallace, and how he, with his German ear, thought that it should be spelled. But again, he put the little hint there HIV, this is an Irish name, and I'm kind of confused to how it should be spelled, to give you at least, okay, I see it, I don't know why he spelled it that way, but if he's struggling and it's an Irish name, it probably makes sense phonetically if I can sound it out. Okay? All right, are you still with me? Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to spend a lot of time on the actual records. And there's three basic types of records that you're going to see. First type is just a blank book. It's just a, a set of pages. There's usually no numbers. There's no um, formatting or anything. It's just it's sometimes they're lined out, but sometimes they're not. And we're going to go through the second one is a column format. And there's some pluses and minuses with that. And then the third one is a pre-printed format, which is a little bit nicer, but it also gets some drawbacks. So um, if, if you use Find My Pass, Family Search, or whatever, and you use their indexes, and you may see something like this. So we look up, uh, in this case, Find Your Family Search, and we see John Tomom Kelly, this is the name of the child, and the father's name is Tomei Kelly, and the mother's name is Katharine Cotton. <laughs> and you think, well, why is that the way it is? Uh, did somebody make a mistake or whatever? But Family Search is volunteer and crowdsourced, and they tell them just whatever you see on there, transcribe and type, type up. Same thing is another example on Ancestry uh, from Boston. It says Patricium Josephum Ryan, so Patrick Joseph Ryan. And the father is Joseph Ryan, and the mother is Helena Downey. And you think, well, what's going on here? Why, why are the names so funny? Well, it's because in Latin, uh, they were told to transcribe it exactly how they see it, and we'll see in a minute why it is the way it is. But before that, we need to kind of step back a little bit, maybe for some of us <laughs> quite a bit, to grade school when we learned grammar and diagramming sentences and all that other fun stuff that we probably forgot or wish to forget. And every sentence has a subject and a verb. And if you have a, a sentence like, I gave the ball to you, I is the subject, give is an action verb, the ball, direct object, to you, an indirect object. And for us in English, it's pretty easy to figure it out. But in Latin, every one of those words has a different ending, how it's used grammatically in the sentence. Um, and so that's the reason sometimes for us, French or Spanish or Italian, which is derived from Latin, 
uh, you think the sentence, but then you got to put all the endings on the words as you're, you're speaking them. I mean, why English is so hard for Europeans, because they're, as they're constructing their sentence and saying it, they're like, well, where's all the endings that tell me what the sentence means? So when you look at the actual records, which here's an example, um, again, this is the first type, it's just a blank page, and the priest writes the inscription out each time, and I wrote it down in blue so you don't have to kind of struggle with the, uh, with the, the copy, is baptizavi, Solum Mariam Filium Johannes Kennedy at Honorai Collins Natum Terra. So it translates is to I have baptized. So that's I as a subject, baptized is the verb, it's an action verb. The direct object of the baptism is Maria, and so as a female name, and it's a little bit more complicated than this, but basically the subject is the male word or male name. It ends in U.S. If it's an object, it ends in U.M. If it's a female, it ends in A as a subject, and A.M. is the direct object. And sometimes that can help you as you're trying to, to figure out the Latin. So here we see Maria and Filion, again, that's a daughter, it's a child, it's a female child, of, and there's the ending for possessive, Johann or Johannes Kennedy, and Honora, when you put the A on to make it possessive. Natam, again, it's a female bird, and Harry means today. So I think some of these are in your, in your handout. Uh, but the next one is the same thing. I have baptized. Muliel Mum, so we know it's a male child. Filium, it's a son, so it's a child, it's a male. Patrick Mulcahill and Honora. Reagan, not to them, as again, it's a male birth, and it gives the name. So sometimes, if, you know, a name like Johanna or Johannes, if it's obliterated and you can't figure out, well, is it a male or female, you look at the endings on here, that means it's a male child, that means it's a female child. And everything in the sentence has to agree with it. So now, uh, when you see things like that, you know, they're looking at this and they're just tr transcribing the name exactly as they see it in the record. The other thing too is you notice the name when it's written out is Mulcahy Hill, uh, but at some point along the line they went and created an index in the margin and you see the handwriting is very different. Here's the K from Kennedy and here's the K in the index. He changed it from Mulcahy Hill to Mulcahy Heath. So either the priest, when he was doing the indexing, says, well, I recognize that family, it's the Mulcahy's. Uh, I'm going to write it that way. But again, if you're a purist, what do you transcribe? Uh, because it's, it's different. We're going to see some other examples where it's really wrong. So is it starting to kind of a little bit why, sometimes when you're seeing that, is why it is. Here's another example. Um, you know, Again, it's all written out. I have baptized Clement Kim. One of the exceptions, so it ends in EM. Uh, but you can see right here, it's Natum, Filium, so you know it's a male child, the son of Johannes, or Johann Heinrich Bakke and Maria Katharina Blina Stegelman. So it's, again, it's written all out. And again, for the Germans, sometimes you see this, the Kleina is a, is a prefix, and in Europe, was used to kind of separate families where you have villages and they're all intermarrying. Sometimes you'll see Groza, Kleina, it just means big and small. Usually in America they dropped it, but the first generation sometimes kept it, but the name you would see would be Stegen. Uh, but you may come across that. The next entry is Aodem, VA, and that's just a preposition that means on the same day. So if you see that for your ancestry, you just have to keep going up and up and up and up until you actually find the original date that they started. And sometimes in some parishes, you have a dozen, sometimes 20 on a given day. And wow. you have to kind of sometimes go back a page or two to find the actual date. So when you have these parishes that were given five and 600 baptisms a year, it was pretty common to have a dozen or more of one day. So this is the second type of format, and it's the columnar format. And you can see it's a lot easier to read. It's a lot more compact. You can kind of go down the list and see the names. And on the right, 
or the, I'm sorry, the left, you see the number of the baptism in the year, and again, it's the day, the month, the year, and you can see all the hash marks, so uh, there's quite a few in one day. The name of the child, the name of the father, and the name of the mother, and how this, this register is, is constructed, I've only got the left-hand page, but if the book is open, if the book is open, this is the left-hand side of the page, and the right-hand side that corresponds it would be the name of the godparents, the birth date or the date of the birth, the name of the priest, and there would be a small column for notations. So you have to read across the pages, and sometimes the problem is, is when they're microfilmed, they're microfilmed with one page, and then the next page, so you have to kind of try to cross-reference. You can't read across. So you see, it, this would be like one page and one page of microfilm. Uh, but the nice thing is, is it's compact. You can kind of go through pretty quickly. The bad thing is almost always the woman, so the mother's maiden name, gets cut off in the binding. So you can see, that, you know, they kind of run out of room and they kind of uh, scrunch it, and when it gets microfilmed, can't really see it. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks that, that I see in that. The other thing too is, particularly in the German parishes, uh, they use a little shorthand. If you see this, just a plain bar, that means it's a double letter. So here it's not Emma, it's E M M A Emma. So it's a trick that they use, and it's pretty frequent. If you just see a plain bar, it means it's a double letter. Uh, they didn't misspell it. So uh, again, in the in the column format, they used the subject or the, the nominative case. So you see the male names end in U.S., U.S., and then the female names typically end in A. So they're not doing the Latin whole sentence of the direct object of the, the baptism. They're just recording it as the subject. So you see, again, when you're dealing with the suffix is the U.S. or the A. Um, here's another format that's very similar, and this one's from, from St. Joseph in the West End. Um, this case, it's a huge book. It's 11 by 17, and they try to get everything on one page, which is nicer. But it's the same kind of format as you see the number of the baptism, uh, the name of the child, the birth date, the baptism date, the name of the parents, the name of the godparents, and the name of the priest baptizing the one thing you notice right away is it's perfect penmanship. It's very neat, it's very distinct, uh, but the priests are all different <laughs> on the right-hand side, and so this book was copied later on. So probably the pages got worn out, they got uh, faded, they got ripped, and I'm being probably a little bit prejudiced, but it looks like a woman's writing because it's so neat. <laughs> so they probably had a nun sit there and transcribe the whole book, and. Um, at least it's, it's nice for us because it's perfect penmanship, but it's not the original. And you can tell because it's all in the same handwriting. The other thing is you see here the illegitimate, the illegitimate child, but here at least they recorded the father. And because it's copied, you don't know whether the baptism was there, it was illegitimate, and at some later date they wrote in the father's name because they subsequently got married or they named it. That's one thing you lose because it's, it's a copy. At least you get the father's name, which is good. Uh, the other thing you're going to see a lot of times is uh, sometimes on the infants, this little plus sign or a little cross, and that typically means the child died as an infant. So you would probably, it wouldn't be your, your great grandfather, in other words. And in this case, probably the signal that they were born on the 19th, they were baptized on the 21st, and the pastor who baptized him was the godfather, so it was probably an emergency and the child died almost you know, right after the baptism. Um, but you'll see that, and that way you'll know that don't look for death probably within a few weeks, a few months. But usually it's an infant death. Uh, this is the third type that you're going to see. It's very nice because it's a book. It's, again, it's a book. There's pre-printed uh, page numbers. The inscription, again, it's the sequence in Latin, Register of Baptisms in the Church of St. Hieronymus. We know that to be St. Jerome. And again, in Oppido, California, in the place of California, in the Diocese of Cincinnati. 
So it's not California the state, it's California the, the suburb on the east side of Hamilton County. But again, it's very nice. You know, you've got the family name here on the left. Uh, you've got the name, the date of the baptism, which they didn't put. But it's the same sequence. It's ego, prescriptus, baptizali, I, the underside, get baptized, and then Josephus. So again, it's the direct object of the baptism. They're writing it, Josephum, natum, female book of earth, on the 18th of October, April, 1878. So it's nicer because it's pre-printed. You don't have to deal with all the, the bad penmanship. The problem is, is um, because there's only three or four <coughs> baptisms per page, if you have a, a big church that has three or 400 baptisms a year, the book's going to run out in a year or two. So they were only primarily used in Hamilton County in rural parishes, and they started probably in the 1870s, the 1880s. Um, but again, if you're lucky enough to have these, a lot easier to see. They tend to be nicer penmanship because they have to kind of fill in the blank um, type, of, type of form. Another thing to be on the lookout, and again, this is St. Peter and Chains. It's 1861, page 108. And you see on the same page, there's three of the same family names. So Jeremiah Hefferton, uh, Joanna, or maybe Jane Hefferton, and then Julia Hefferton, all baptizing children in the same week. So probably a hint that your brother and sister, they're related somehow. So if you've got other family to track down, uh, make sure if you find your ancestor, look on that page or the other pages, that you may see collateral lines that may give you further help. So that's page 108. If you look at page 109, the next page, there's two with the name Mayer, uh, Kate and John, on the same day, bringing their children to be baptized. And then uh, further down, on 116, you've got three, uh, Bernard Cannon, uh, Ann Cannon, and Katharina Cannon, all on the same day. So do you think there's probably a relationship there uh, to be investigated? So again, start to think about that as you're going through and you're finding your names, uh, you look on the same page, you look on the next page, you may see other collateral lines to, to research. Here's an example, and it, it's kind of a shame to say it's, it's my bad luck when I first started. I had an ancestor, John Kluge, who appeared in Cincinnati in 1840 in the city directory. I spent probably a couple hundred dollars sending requests to the, the archives for all of his children, and when I finally got him, I said, okay, that's nice. I looked at the godparents and there was no clues or shelves there. And you see here, I put it on the side. Uh, the first three were at Holy Trinity. The second one, or the third one, sorry, the fourth one was at St. John the Baptist. And the last three were at St. Joseph. Uh, the family moved a little, but not very far. But if you go back to the chart and you see St. John the Baptist was founded in 1845. So the parish split and St. Joseph's was founded in 1847, so the parish again split, and again, three different churches, they really didn't move that far. So what I did is looked at every clue in Cincinnati, researched them, found nothing, looked at every shelf and every collateral line that I could find, and finally found one married sister um, that I found an obituary for in a German paper that listed her place of birth, I thought it was in good luck. Uh, I went to the family search and none of that had been microfilmed, so I had to go to Germany. No. Found him, found the records, made copies, came home and started filing them all and looked through all these and said, well, I recognize all these names. I saw all these in the church in Germany where they came from. So I looked at the first one, Nicholas Alt, and the Volks uh, Freund in an obituary that said the same parish uh, where they came from in Germany. So. If you're stuck and you think, well, they came here alone, I can't find anybody else of that name that came to Cincinnati, start looking at all the godparents and start researching them. It would have saved me probably a couple hundred dollars a trip to Germany and about three years of researching <laughs> if I would have taken that hint. Again, you think of it, if somebody's got a name or, you know, if their, their child is a godparent, it's going to be somebody that they're close to. If it's not the same name, it may be somebody that they came across with, with the same um, town in Europe that they're still close to. So again, if you're dealing with first generation, that may be a good hint. And the other thing is, you know, for the Germans in particular, 
you notice the very uh, pattern that follows quite a bit is the daughter's Christina, the godmother's Christina, son, John Joseph, John Joseph, Nicholas, the godfather Nicholas. Every one of their children, if you look, um, they're named either after the godfather or the godmother. And so, again, that's a pattern, and you think, okay, if they're going to name their child after that, it has to be some sort of close relation. Again, sometimes, um, you know, with the Germans, when they, they write out their, their names in the baptism, they get two, three, sometimes even four names, and you try to figure out which one is the real name, um, and there's no pattern. So here, as is, is a, is a family, you see their kids, the names, but when you look in the census, uh, I underline the actual name they went with. Um, so, you know, in our tradition, it's usually the first name is the one they're called, the second name is their baptism name, and everybody forgets about it. But in different traditions, um, a lot of times, the second or the third name, or even what they call a Spitznama, which is a nickname, is what they go by. So, you know, if you see them in the census and you think, well, that doesn't match up at all, you have to look and start thinking a little bit, a little bit different. The Irish ones, unfortunately, sometimes they didn't put the, the mother's maiden name. I guess they thought it wasn't all that important. But you'll see that time and time again. In this entry, it says on the same day, again, so you have to go up into March, uh, Michael born the 2nd of March from John Walsh and his wife. So they didn't even name the mother. I guess they thought she wasn't important in the event. <laughs> but so most of the times you'll see an example of John Walsh and his wife, Mary. And they were married, so they didn't put necessarily her maiden name. But you may come across that quite a bit. So here's an example of what we talked about before with phonetics and spelling. And you see they're in the same parish, they're two years, three years apart, so it's it's kind of a hint, but I baptized Michael, the son of Eugene Carr, C A R E N S and Rose A. Kelly. And then down below it says I have baptized Joseph, the son of Owen. Ears, K E A R N S. And if you're looking at an index, one's going to be in the C's, one's going to be in the K's. Are you going to see that or are you going to miss it? Uh, and so you got to start thinking a little bit. If you've got a missing child that you know from the census is there, you know, the, the mother's name is kind of the, the giveaway that it's the same mother's name. You start thinking, okay, the C's and the K's are interchangeable. And we know from before that Eugene. And Owen is the Gaelic version of that, so it's really the same father's name, just spelled differently. But even you see in the actual records here, up here, it's with the C, and then when they indexed it, it looks like a C and they overwrote it with a K, and then down here it's the same thing. It looks like they wrote it with a C, and then they overwrote it with a K, and then they wrote it more pronounced over here. So again, interchangeable when you start seeing things like this start to um, to be on the lookout. So to reinforce it, let's look at all these examples and you think these are the same thing. So again, if you don't look at the right hand side, don't look at the father and the mother's name, and you just go down, are you going to at first see these as siblings? So you've got O'Laughlin, Laughlin, McLaughlin, all those could be very different names, but they're all baptized in the same parish, they have the same father and the same mother's name. Uh, yeah. Start thinking about the variations. Nick Gander, Nick Andrew, Williams, Williams, Mick Williams, Hidney, 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 McHugh, McHugh, and McHugh. So again, you know, they're going to be in different places in an index. Uh, and if you're scanning down, you may think, okay, are these the same names? But if you're looking at the, at the parents, and the mothers, and even you can see different ways to spell Riley uh, for the mother's name. So again, you have to put everything together. It kind of looks like it fits it's the same parish. Each of the child is about two, two and a half years apart. So you can kind of make your story to put it together. The same thing here, so a few more examples. I love the, the second uh, the set of examples, Whitney, Whitney, and Whitney. <laughs> so again, Phonetically, it doesn't it kind of sound, but you're going to find them in very different places in an index. And there again, they didn't write Mother's Day name. It was just written as Patrick, Whitney, and his wife, Catherine. Uh, O'Donnell, O'Donnell, McDonald, O'Donnell. 
And then the final example here on this page is they're not the same family, but a name like Shea. Again, this was most likely a, a German pastor at St. John's in Dry Ridge. He wrote it as Shea, S-H-E-A. And then another entry, if you pronounce that with the, the umlauts in German, it's Shea. So again, you're probably not going to see that as first as an Irish name if you're looking at it, but phonetically, it's very similar. Um, and so it's probably, if you know, you're looking for the Shea's, it's going to be your name. Again, beating a dead horse here, you can see a few more, even more wilder examples. And then the last one here, do we think this is really the same family? So we've got a James Henry Wynn, a Mary Sweeney, and a Helen. Any votes? Do you think it's the same family or not? So let's look at the original entry. And it says, I have baptized Maria, Maria A, the legitimate daughter of Dionysi, so Dennis, Sweeney, and Bridget Gallagher. And the sponsors are Patrick Wynn and Mary Carney. So do you think maybe he transposed the Godfather and the yeah. Father? Yeah. So you probably never see that, uh, you know, catch that unless you're looking at the mothers and, you know, you have to go back through the census probably. And, but again, it's the original record, and if you're a purist, when you index it, you have to index what's there. Uh, now I did go and check just to make sure, and I looked at the census in 1870, and there is spelled it as Winnie, Dennis Winnie, but you see the mother, the oldest son, Mary, and they pronounced it as Allie. So maybe Ellen would be Ellen or Ellie. Um, but again, it's, it confirms that the original record is he transposed the father's name with the Godfather. Again, with the original record, they, they wrote McFlowery, and they indexed it as McLaurey. And this one, they actually got the wrong name. The father's name is Michael Donahue, and Mary McDermott, and he wrote McDermott in the in the margin. So sometimes, you know, when we do, when we and I do the index, we try to catch those, and we put them both ways because you got to put the original as it stands, but you know it's it's incorrect. We try to put the, the correct one, or the, the more logical one. But again, if you're a purist, you have to index what's written. Again, this was kind of a, a funny one. Um, when they wrote it, or when they, when they baptized him, it's Immaculata. Its uh, father's name is Frederick Duval, D U D E L, and Christina Riber. Um, and in there, he makes a little note Protestant, so the father's Protestant, but when they indexed it, they indexed the name as Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> How they came up with that, but um, it's per certainly creative. Uh, and then again, you know, the mother's name, and this is more prominent here, and his eyes gravitated to that, and he wrote the name as, as Barrett, instead of the father's name as, as Harney. So again, some things to be pitfalls to, um, to be aware of. A lot of times, we talked about uh, illegitimate children, and the children are always baptized. Uh, you see it in the register. But this particular priest, when he was indexing in St. Xavier, was illegitimate and he didn't index the name. So and that was, I guess, their punishment or whatever. He wasn't going to index them. Sure. I saw a page where Fallon had a whole page of the legitimate So It's like he went somewhere and found him. Some of these, it's not on here, but he was going to St. Mary's Hospital. So, you know, it's, kids came in and you know, they were in danger of dying, they would baptize them, but a lot of times it was just women that came there with their children and, you know, under unfortunate circumstances. So they always baptized the child, but um, they weren't going as far as indexing their names. For some mm -hmm. um, and then you get the usual, you know, where you get the ink blots through the name, you get the torn pages. Um, the good thing is, is when you're indexing a whole family, sometimes you can put together and make an educated guess of what the name is. You know, we try to do that um, as we see things, but you're going to see those um, time and time again. Um, marriages, real quick. I know this is an example of, of St. Joseph in the West End. 
and you see the same handwriting, so the four nun, probably after she got done with the baptisms, and they gave her the marriages, <laughs> and she did such a good job. Uh, but you see by the 1870s, they're starting, at least in the marriages, to record the parents' names. So uh, that could be a strategy, as if you, you've got a family, and you've got a younger sibling, married later, you may want to start looking through those marriage records. Sometimes, again, they get the place of birth, and you'll see that in a second. But again, the farther you get in the 19th century, the more they tend to record. And then for marriages, again, the pre-printed form. And again, this is a little bit later. These are smaller churches. Well, not St. Philomena so much. But again, in the 1870s, 1880s, when they started using this, they put a lot more information. So again, you know, Patrick Ryan from County Tipperary, son of Patrick Ryan, and Delia Lowey from County, and they put meow, but I think it's mayo, um, the way you spelled it, a daughter of James Lowey. So again, you're getting more information the later you go in the 19th century. So if you've got girl, you know, siblings that are later, you may want to start checking their marriages and going through the original records that you may get some helpful hints there. On deaths, so this is, again, we're going back to the early ones and the, the blank pages, and they had to write out the whole sequence. So again, you know, on the 11th of January, Sepulvi I have buried, same format, Henry, Henry Philip, so Enrico Filippo, around two years old, the son of Michael Live and Francisca Schetzer. Uh, and then again, Aodem, the same day, and then the 15th and so forth. So you get the same format in the deaths and the marriages early on with the blank pages of uh, that same sequence of uh, how they write it out. And then the last one here is St. Francis Sarah. And again, you notice right away it's the same thing. It's all the same handwriting, so it's been recopied. And it's in German, so it was probably later in the 19th century when the German language was more popular once Germany reunified after 1871. Uh, but again, it's a great recording. Here, the number of the, the burial on the, the left-hand side, the date of the, the funeral, the person's name, and it's all written in the old German script, but it's very neat and the copy is very good. So Stephen Froelicher, the V stands for Verheiratet, so it means he's married, and then it gives his wife's name, Maria Flettner. So her maiden name is there. Same thing on the 10th, Carolina Meisinger, V Verheiratet, married, and her husband's name, Valentine Kaufman. So you got her maiden name, her husband's name, and this is again the same thing. This is the left hand side of the page. On the right hand side, you've got the date of death, you've got their age, and usually it's in year, month, day format, so it's very particular, very specific. The name of the priest, and then usually the name of the cemetery where they're buried. So again, it's very it's very complete. You see here the L stands for Latex single, and so this would be a child, and this would be the father, and this would be the mother. And then again, on the other side would be the, the age and then the date of death. So it's a little bit harder to struggle through this because it's the, the German script. It's written in German. But again, it's a very nice copy. It's, it's very good penmanship. And it's got lots of information. So does this make a little bit more sense now? So when you see this kind of stuff, it indexes is it how to deal with it and at least you're familiar to how to interpret it and why it is the way you yes, no, maybe. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the transcriptions they work on first, and they're going to transcribe them as they see it, just like this. The images will look like what you saw. I don't know if they will be able to make them look any better. So, are we ready for a 10 minute break? <laughs> yes. At the break, Julie then had a couple things that I forgot to mention, and she said, Be sure to, to, to mention it because she sees it all the time at the Archdiocese. And when we talk briefly about marriage records, for the Catholics, it, they could either be married through the bans or through the license um, in Hamilton County and, and other places too. So 
before the, the law changed in the 1940s that you had to have a license after that. But before that, if you could be married, married by the bands, and what happened was you went to the, the parish, the priest did the three readings of the bands, or if it was you had to get married in a hurry, they had a dispensation. <laughs> um, then they married, and then the priest took the marriage record to register at some point down to the courthouse, and he had to register all those in a separate book, the bands. And so if they're Catholic, they could be either married through the license or the bands, and they're very they're two very separate registers. If you don't you look at the, the licenses, you don't find them, you look in the bands, sometimes they forgot to go go register. So you may find a marriage in the actual parish register and not in the bands. But in general the Irish tended to go with the license because they were used to the English system and the law. The Germans, because there wasn't really a unified law there, they tended to go the easier way and just go by the Married by the bands. So, you know. marriage bands. That's what we talked about at the, the beginning. Is when you man and woman decide they wanted to get married, they would go to the priest and say, "We're going to get married on this date." And the priest, more recently in, in parish bulletins, but before that, at the end of mass, they would read, "These are the people that are going to get married. This is the first reading of the bands. The second reading, the next Sunday." the third reading, and then they would typically get married the next next week. Um, and that would give people in the parish, in the, the area, a chance to say, well, I know so-and-so, they're already married, or they're divorced, or um, these two are really first cousins or second cousins, they're related. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Okay. The other thing is you could get a, mar a license outside of Hamilton County and still get married at a church in Hamilton. County. So if you find the, the marriage in one of the parishes, you don't find the license, you may try you know, Covington, Claremont County, Butler County, and so forth. They just had to have a marriage, a valid license for the bands. And usually it was um, within a week or so, or a couple days after getting the license, they got <coughs> married. And then you just mentioned the traveling priest. Sometimes early on, before all the parish system was established, <coughs> A lot of times, the priests were on uh, missions or circuit, kind of the circuit rider system with the uh, the Protestants, where they would go up north into the, the you know, other counties, baptize all the children, and they would make a two-week loop, and then they would come back and record them all, their Holy Trinity or the cathedral or something. Uh, they could go up as far as Dark County, Shelby County, up farther north, and so a lot of times if you have ancestors up there and you can't find baptisms, they may have come back down here and the priest recorded in one of the parishes here. So it's worth worth looking. Alright, so this is kind of where we pull everything together as an as example. And I thought, like I said before, when we started, we use an Irish family as an example this time because we always use Germans and it's a little bit more interesting and challenge another hit the challenges. And usually speakers always use their own family as an example. But my Irish line is not a Hamilton County line, and it's kind of an unusual one where they have appeared in Indiana in the 1830s, then were in Washington County, and then they were in New York in the 1750s. So it's not at all a traditional one. So I didn't think that was very exciting for us. Uh, but I did find something, and um, I'm going to go through this, and I, I learned a lot, and it was fun for me, and I hope we learned a lot on this. So this is me. And that's my little sister. And the two people there on the couch with me is my great great aunt and uncle. And it was known to me as Aunt Clara and Uncle Jack. Aunt Clara was my grandmother's aunt or my great grandmother's sister. And you can see there, they're at a very advanced age. And Aunt Clara was about as German as you could be. She was born in Minster, Ohio, which is about two hours north of here in Ogilvy's County. You know anything about Minster? It's about 99 and 44 one hundredths pure German. Yeah. Um, and she actually, all of her class books, and you know, when she spoke at home with her parents, it was in German. And she married my uncle Jack, and he was about as Irish as you could be. And the same there with his, his green shirt. And they never had any children, and he was, you know, a, not really a relation. So I never invested in researched him at all. Um, so I thought this would be a challenge because I know he was very, very proud of him. 
Uh, so what, the only thing I really knew about him is he was born on Halloween, and I remember that because of trick-or-treating for his birthday present, he would always want one piece of our candy <laughs> as his birthday present. He was a, oil, a truck driver for an oil company during the Depression, so he had steady work. He had a sister, Julia, who died as an adult and was buried in Calvary Cemetery in the east side of town. His mother lived with him as a widow. I remember him celebrating their 50th anniversary in 1968, so that would make him uh, married in 1918. And how they met was she, was she came down to Cincinnati for work, and she was an upstairs maid for Dr. Holmes, uh, Holmes Hospital and he was the chauffeur. So um, that's kind of how they made that. I remember him being a huge fan of John Gilligan. Of course, he's always a local boy, Irish, Catholic. He could just do no wrong. And I always remember him sitting in the chair and try to tickle me and tease me all the time. So I thought, well, it'd be an interesting thing to find out if I could find out where he, his family came from, because I knew nothing about him. And you know about as much as I did when I started. So we always start with the census, and we start with 1940, which is the most recent. And I highlight him in, in yellow as we go, go back, and we find it in 1940, they're living on Duck Creek Road, which is the street where it's Calvary Cemetery is. Um, and his wife and his aunt, Mary, Richard Horman, which is my grandmother's uh, brother, and Jane Fisher, which uh, I know that's Ann Clara's mother, so she had her mother living with them. Uh, and then we go back, and so in the 1930s, they're living at the same address, and the aunt living with them. And you start to see some of the ages starting to diverge and not being consistent. Um, <laughs> yeah. They go back in the 1920s. They're living in Mount Adams. They had just gotten married. Uh, but the, the family's still living on Duck Creek Road residence, and we see a Mary B. Lyons, uh, 65 and widow, that was his mother, his sister Julia, and then the aunt again, Aunt Mary, 59. So at least her age is, is pretty consistent going along, and you can kind of track, you know, as things vary by either dress or, you know, other people living in the household. And then we go back to 1910, we see that they're living now in Avondale, in Glenwood Avenue. And we see, again, the mother. And now he's living in the household with his sister and his mother. And we see uh, his mother's widow, born in Ireland. So we've got the original immigrant now. And then every census gives a little bit inf different information. So it's always important to look through all of them. In 1910, it says she had four children and two were alive. And then she came to the US in 1872. Uh, we go back in 1900. Again, they're living at the same address. And she refers to herself there as Mrs. Lyons, and to distinguish her from her sister-in-law, Mary, which is her husband's um, sister, and then Uncle Jack, Julia, and then, interesting, Ella Flynn, 20, born in Ireland, and niece. So because it's uh, Flynn, uh, and it's not her name, it's got to be her, Ella Flynn's mother, and Mrs. Lyons, her sister. And that's was kind of an important clue because that's kind of how I broke through this was she came in a lot later and I found out through the passenger list they had a lot more information later on uh, but again you have to use all the censuses look for every piece of information and relationships and try to build the family together so we look at marriage licenses and as Julie said we you know we've got uh, lucky here we go to the Hamilton County probate court site we look up, we find their marriage, uh, book 294, page 271, again 1918, and it lists a lot of information about him. So it lists uh, basically his birth date. So he was 34 on October 31st, 1918, so that would make him born in 1884. It lists his parents, John J. Lyons and Mary Dunleavy, so we got her maiden name now. Uh, he was born in Cincinnati, he was still see the, the same residence. And then Clara Fisher, again, it's a, kind of a strange way to put their birth date, but basically if you calculate, she was born March 8th, 8, 1892, in Minster, Ohio, and her parents are John Fisher and Jim Schell. So, again, lots of information here, and it's online, it's a digitized image. Um, all the licenses in the courthouse are, are online, you can get this at home for free. So the next step is we, we look and they were married by Father Ronnebaum, who's a Catholic priest. Uh, we want to find out a little bit more information. 
So we find in the city directory, he was at Holy Family. And the nice thing is, when you look at their wedding picture, I had no idea who these other two people were. But in the actual marriage license, it gives the witnesses, and it says it's Frederick Smith and Margaret Flynn. So it's a nice way when you've got pictures that you don't know who the witnesses are or the, the best man and the, the maid of honor. If you look at the church record, uh, it lists them. And you see again the name Flynn. So if again, we're starting to see some clues and some patterns. And you know my, my aunt there with her nice German smile. <laughs> and we try to use the same strategy for their parents' license, but it doesn't work. In Hamilton County, because of the courthouse fire in 1884, we look and we don't see anything as a marriage license, but when we use the, the restored marriages index, we find them. August 17, 1882, uh, it's not the original license because that was destroyed in the fire, uh, but we find a notice in the newspaper that gives us a date, and we search in our clue because you know the Avondale St. Andrews Parish is in Avondale, and we find the marriage record on 18th or 16th of August, 1882, and it says on the 16th of August by David O'Hara, pastor of St. Andrews, and Avondale married John Lyons and Mary Dunleavy after three proclamations, and the witnesses are Peter Melvin and Ellie Cullen. So again, it doesn't give a whole lot of information, but at least we've got it documented. We can keep going back. So we start to build out you know, the tree with what we know. We know them. We know she had four children, and we don't know the other two. We know she was born in Ireland about 1860, but again, uh, that's kind of suspect because her age varied wildly across all the different senses. Uh, and then we see the Aunt Mary there, his sister, that lived up until they 1940s. So again, you know, we, we keep going step by step, try to put the family together, and then uh, we go back uh, past 1900. The next one is 1880. Luckily, they're still living at the same address. And we find his father is a 23-year-old, and we see his father, Jeremiah Lyons. Uh, he's a widower. Uh, he's 18, or he's 16 years old, so he's a more advanced age. We see again the Aunt Mary was there as a 20-year-old. We keep going back, 1870, now there. You don't get addresses, that's where we go back and switch to wards. But we, now we see his mother. So uh, Jeremiah is 50, his wife Mary, and we start to see the common names, Julia, Mary, and so forth, uh, within the family. And then we go back to 1860, and this really gives us a lot of clues, because now he shows up as a three-year-old He's got an older brother, Dennis, and an older sister, Julia, and she's 10 years old and says she's born in Ireland. So it gives us now a time frame of when they left Ireland and when they came to America. So about 1850, so we wouldn't find them in the 1850 census uh, because they were still in Ireland. But it gives his parents, in this case, Jerry and Mary, uh, and again, you see some variation in age across the different censuses, which is, is normal, and you have to kind of sort that out. So there we go, and we use the um, 1850s church index, and we try to find uh, the baptism record of the three uh, children that were, were born in Ohio, in Cincinnati, and we find it in St. Thomas Church, all three of them, and we find the original record, and we find the mother's name, maiden name, is Mary Walsh. So we lucked out there, parents are Jeremiah Lyons and Mary Walsh. So we've got a little bit more information now. We can go back to actually his grandparents, who were the original immigrants to this country, and we know a little bit about them. And you see kind of step by step how we're trying to put things together. Then the next step is his burial records. So this is New St. Joseph, and if you've ever uh, researched for a while and you've struggled with before the, the website came on, you had to go, there was no index, you had to go microfilm page by page by page by page, and it took a long, long time because there was a lot of errors. But there's the website there, uh, the URL. It's a free website, which is good, and it's a great website. Um, it's very easy to use. And so we put in the name, uh, and we see three Jeremiah Lyons. The date of death, there's nothing there. But the trick with this website is uh, when you bring up the web browser, you see 
this portion of it, um, you think you're done. But if you scroll all the way, go all the way over to the right, there's a little scroll bar. You scroll all the way down, and then you'll see another scroll bar, and you scroll <laughs> all the way over to the right. So you got to move it. You see this information here, and it gives the date of internment, so it helps, their age, and their parents' names. So that's something that if you don't consciously scroll over, you're going to miss. And I think that's pretty key information. So, yes? Yeah, you can find them in the column. Right. Okay. But I mean, as default, when it comes up, if you're not used to it, you bring it up and you say, okay, I see a lot of these blank columns. And if you don't scroll over, you're going to miss it. So it's just something I probably point out. So you use that, and you see and he's buried in the northeast plot, uh, lot 24, south part, and range 16. So you use the same thing, and you enter it up here, and you do the search again, and essentially you get the whole family. So you get um, the mother, the father, the sister, and all their ages, and their parents, and something interesting, you get uh, Mrs. Lyon's sister, so Ann Dunleavy. She died as a single in 1917, and it gives her parents, John Dunleavy and Honora O'Gara. So now you've got um, her parents and her age, and so you can calculate um, the age in Ireland. So again, this is a great site to find a lot of information pretty quickly and pretty easily for your Irish ancestors. Okay. What was NEP mean? Northeast North plot. plot. So it's a section. Oh, okay. They, they had sections one, two, three, four, but they also had the northeast plot, the southeast okay. plot, the southwest or the <laughs> northwest plot, uh, and then old singles. So that somehow they. Try to guess on the headstone. Right. Rooms. right. It's, it's not very <laughs> easy. Uh, but as great as the website is, there's more in the original records. So. For whatever reason, in the original records, uh, they also recorded, which I think is significant, the place of birth and the priest that buried them. And so if you go into the original microfilm records, you're going to find that information. And in the chapter book, was it, 18, runs up to 1894, that information is extracted. So um, if you've got earlier deaths and burials, you may want to check in the, in the book it does a little easier. So again, you pull up all the lines, family, and it shows you know, the children, the missing children that were born in Avondale, and you scroll down and you see consistently County Cork. So you use that, and we know the Lyons family now is from County Cork, and the Dunleavy family is from County Roscoe. So again, we're doing all this from home. It is on the website, very easy. Um, but again, it's when you use the website, you got to remember to scroll over to the right or, as you mentioned, get rid of some of the columns uh, so you can see that. And then there's other information that's not on the website that can be kind of important. Uh, it's at the public library. And so the other thing that to point out here, this is an actual copy from uh, the St. Jo New St. Joe's record. And you may kind of recognize the format, but you see when they started, they wrote everything out longhand. And the, the second one here, permit by Father Bender to bury John Burns, bury range 22, grave 12, large single nativity, County Limerick, uh, Ireland, residence Lynn Street, parents James and Honora, age 23, disease, killed in the stone yard. So, What's key here is, remember we, we talked before about the Irish parishes didn't keep burial records? Well, really, they were keeping their burial records in New St. Joe's. Because isn't this, this kind of that same sequence, except it's in English, you know, I have buried so-and-so. So for the first generation and the early ones, you better, if you're doing Irish research, get pretty close and friendly with the New St. Joe's records, because those are going to be a old ones. And you can see early on, they're listing the parents, their age, where they were born, the parish. You, know, you can look and see where Father Bender was in 1869. 
um, and you can then find the parish that he was associated with uh, for further information. But again, these records, they start in 1868. They're very complete, and they're very easy to read, and they got lots of information. So that's the good news. Even though they, they didn't keep burial records in the parish, they were keeping them in the New St. Joe Cemetery. Uh, so then we look at immigration lists, uh, passenger lists, and we think, you know, the Lions came between 1850 and 1853, and we see them there coming through Castle Garden in New York uh, in 1852, and it looks like he's got a younger, the father, Jeremiah, has got a younger brother, Dennis, that came with him. Remember that he named the early, or the first son, Dennis, so you see the same patterns repeating. It was a little bit harder to find uh, Mary Dunleavy, but uh, the one, two censuses were consistent that she said she came in 1872. So I looked hard and I found again in uh, Castle Garden, uh, she came as a 20 year old. And again, the same uh, register a few lines up, you see the name Catherine Flint. So that relationship is still there even when she came over originally. So we use all that and we use family search and it's, again, it's a free site so it's, it's good uh, we knew uh, john dunleavy and Honora obera uh, we typed it in and we see again the latin form of those names uh, coming up so we're in luck uh, and it says that they were married in 1840 in boyle county roscommon ireland and you can keep using that and searching the baptisms and pretty quickly, you can get the whole family together. And I found an entry for a Mary in 1853. Again, maybe a little bit more research because her, her age and her date of birth kind of varied so much, but at least it's consistent when she came over in 1872 as a 20-year-old. Um, what's interesting is when you go and keep following, uh, the sister Anne got married to a Patrick Flynn. So that's where the connection comes in. So again, it's starting to make, make sense. But again, when you look at the citation, family search, you look at the collection, it says Ireland marriages, 1619 to 1898. And you look at when it was indexed, February of 2018. So if I would have done this, wow. this exercise a year ago, I wouldn't have found it. So again, if you've been frustrated with Irish research, probably now is the time to, to jump in and take another look again. Um, this was pretty easy and pretty quick to find. So I, I did the same thing with the Lyons family and I tried to find my pass. Uh, and I got the same sort of success. Uh, I found their marriage in 1846 in Murrah, I guess I'm hoping I'm pronouncing, pronouncing that right, in County Cork. So it's, a, it's listed as Jerry Lyons and Mary Walsh. So again, it's the same, the same people that we saw in Cincinnati. Uh, in the parish of Murrock and County Cork. And then further research says that they were born about five miles up the road in a town called Bandon, uh, County Cork, so they needed to be the precursor parish, or they just, you know, they, they moved to a different farm down the road, but it's very, very close. So now I've got, got both of them back into Ireland. Uh, so I use some of these other ones that are on, on your syllabus. Uh, to help verify, so again, Cincinnati uh, deaths and obits, they're not very helpful, but at least they can, if you're uh, trying to pinpoint things, and sometimes they do have the cause of death and the age, you can help verify that. Cincinnati deaths, they're online at the UC Lagan website, those are free, so you can look at headstones, but again, the Irish tend to have just a simple family stone that says Ryan or Kelly, versus the Germans where we have a specific name, the birth, the death, and so forth. Uh, they tend to be more family stones or plots. Uh, Griffith's valuation, again, ancestry, family search, find my past, uh, at least family search is free. Uh, so you can use all those, those uh, websites. And here's a picture of, uh, of Mary Dunleavy Lyons, and she does look like a, a happy person, doesn't she? <laughs> Smiling there, the yard with Michael Jack. And then there is his sister, the one that died is of appendicitis. And then she is again, and there's my aunt, again, with a nice German smile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How did you associate the photos? Were they from the family? Or were they my grandmother had them. Mm -hmm. 
and it was her aunt, and they, since they didn't have any kids, it passed by. So, but I thought it's kind of interesting, especially, you know, that picture, she's got such a big smile on her, on her face. And you can kind of see both that I would expect, you know, his father to be a big, stout man, too, because he was pretty big, and so was his sister. So, you know, that side of the family was probably pretty tall and pretty, pretty stout. <laughs> uh, but again, that kind of paints the whole picture and puts things together. So you can see pretty quickly, using a lot of free resources and a lot of things that have come online within the last year or so, I could fill out pretty much the whole family tree and then even go back another generation into Ireland using the free records. And then just to show Bandon and County Cork, right there, uh, pretty close to the coast. And you see some images on Google that I found that shows the town that looks kind of scenic. And then for the Dunleavy side and County Roscommon, that's a little bit farther north. Again, some you know, pictures. And you see Boyle is right here, next, next to County Sligo and Lake Guerra. So maybe that's kind of related to the, the mother's name, Hannah Honora O'Gara. But again, it kind of, it was suspicious at first, but it kind of seemed like things kind of coalesced and uh, came together as I, I put more and more things together. So again, uh, you know, use the indexes where they exist. It's, it's a lot easier and a lot painful, less painful. Uh, but if you don't find everything, don't give up. And then start thinking of the way we kind of went through some of the examples of using phonetic spellings, trying to look at other strategies, have to do with the brute force method and just go through uh, the records frame by frame. Uh, that's still an option. But use the census to the fullest. Don't just get one census and then just jump to something else because everyone has a little bit different information. Uh, you can get things from each one of them individually. And then again, if you get stuck, uh, don't think you're at a brick wall. Start to look at godparents, start to look at marriage witnesses, start to look at um, fellow passengers. And if you start to see common names, like we saw Flynn, there's got to be a relation somewhere. And that niece, when she came over much later, it did verify it on the passenger list the last place of residence. So I was kind of confirmed that I was in the right place. But again, you know, those of us that have been frustrated with Irish research, um, there's just been an incredible amount of, of progress, particularly for us in Hamilton County, over the last couple of years. So it's time probably to jump back in and make another pass. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.